how much you're blessing us. Amen. Amen. How much you're blessing God's people. It's really powerful. You know, Scott, I was going to say, I heard this up there. When Jerry was, I think, first grade, he wouldn't speak. He was a backwards. And uh, one of the kids thought he couldn't talk. And so <laughs> that kid's next door neighbor was a school teacher, and she knew better. So, but uh, she would sit there with the ruler and he'd cry a little bit and read a little bit. Cry a little bit, read a little bit. Aww. And uh, I think Donnie, now look at him, you know, Donnie, I mean, back in 2007, he got his uh, cordon finger cut off at work and he couldn't play music for a while. But God has blessed him. He had to learn to record some of the songs and God has blessed him. And, and I think if you use your account for him, God will bless you. Amen. And I just want to thank God for that. When I was in kindergarten, I thought Vivian had the coolest name. Her maiden name is Vi. Vivian Vi. I thought that's the coolest name. <laughs> here you are. Here we are in church. 51 years young. God is good, isn't he? Thank you all for being here. And we're so excited to have Brother Steve Nelson back. I want to give him an introduction. I'm going to turn it over to him. And don't worry. Uh, we have food prepared. So once we get done, we will go straight over and eat. And... So, uh, Brother Steve Nelson was born and grew up in Wisconsin. Is that right? Wisconsin? Wisconsin. We were all in for a treat, I was going to tell you. Um, we had Brother Steve here for several years. He was called to preach right here in the ministry. Um, he was, uh, he rededicated his life to God, and we watched him really grow in Christ, and I got to perform uh, his wedding back there with Miss Shar. Shar is with us today. Who's a nurse, and it's so good. She has her mommy with her today, and it's so good to have you with us as well. And, um, but he, he did a lot while he was here. He worked with our youth. He uh, he did a lot with our nursing home ministry. Brother Steve, we're still very active in nursing home ministry. We have Kingsbrook Nursing Home going very strong every Tuesday, and uh, God has really used our church over the years to reach out. Um, he is the pastor of Rosemont Nazarene Church over in Ohio. Let's give a warm welcome, Reverend Steve. Been here for a few years now, haven't you? Uh, praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. God is good. Amen. And all the time. There we go. Bill, your uh, wife had called me yesterday. I've got a uh, pillow and blanket in the car, so you should be good to go. <laughs> I know, I said Bill, I meant Joe. Well, praise the Lord. I appreciate the Gray family, and I remember working in a nursing home with them. And uh, You know, uh, I got saved in South Korea when I was 19 years old. I was there, there for the Army. Got involuntarily extended because we went to Afghanistan before it was a war. It was an operation. And uh, the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Um, young, dumb, and stupid, and all my clothes and all my food and shelter were paid for. And then they gave me money on top of it. So I did all the dumb things that a 19-year-old boy would do 7,000 miles from home. And then one night... Uh, one of my fellow soldiers asked me to come to his room and play a Bible game. And I don't know why I said yes at the time. But two and a half hours later, after I spilled my guts and my life story, I accepted God, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it was a radical transformation. Overnight, that next morning, I came out of my bedroom. I came out of my, my dorm room. With a Bible in my hand and the keys to the arms room in the other, just like a good soldier. Not just for the United States Army, but also for God's army. Yeah. Amen. I had the Shekinah glory shining off of my face. I didn't know what it was at the time, but as I got into the scripture and began to understand, I realized what God had done. And uh, as I sit back there and enjoy the, the music and Reminisce about all the different things that we have done here at Wortland Nazarene. I, I am just in awe 
and how God just continues to bless over and over and over again. I recently had, uh, my father passed away recently, and some of my co-workers came and asked me what they could do and did a very nice thing and got a, a, a little gift basket for me to be able to travel up to uh, Bowling Green, Ohio, where he was living near my sister. And a couple of them snuck on to Facebook. I don't have any social media. I don't have anything good to share other than Jesus. Not that that's not good enough. But, uh, and uh, they asked what my favorite scripture was. And some of you might know, uh, Romans 8, 28. God works all things for the good for those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. And I had a, a co-worker whose wife does needle stitching, and she made a beautiful uh, piece for me and, and put it in a frame that's in my office. And every day it reminds me that no matter what's going on, no matter what I see in the news, no matter what's going on over in Iraq, Afghanistan, no matter what my neighbor is doing next door, not locking his dog up, God's got it all under control. And as I sat back there and got to thinking about how awesome God is, he told me, there's a couple people here today who don't know that they know. Either they've never given a chance or they're in doubt. I don't know who you are, but I know who the God I serve is. And he wants to help you. He wants to be there for you. But you've got to be willing to step out for him. Amen. It sounds, it sounds so simple. And yet, it's so difficult. Right now, there's a few people. There's particularly a young person. I don't know who they are. Your hands are sweating. Your heart's beating fast. Your mind is racing. And you don't know what's going on. Let me help you out with that. That's called conviction. That's called Holy Ghost Conviction. Uh, and if you weren't excited with the Grays singing, not only are they good singers, but you can tell that was the power of the Holy Ghost. Why do you think he was sweating? Why do you think they were crying and wiping their eyes? Because it's the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. And if you didn't feel that power, as Bill would say, your wood is bad. But that's okay. The Holy Ghost is here. He's got the fire to dry your wood right up. Yeah. Hallelujah. Turn to the book of Jonah. Turn to the book of Jonah. It's page 977. <laughs> In my Bible, anyway. I remember the day that uh, we transferred over here from another Nazarene church. and I remember how warm and wonderful it was. And I didn't understand why God wanted me to move from one Nazarene church to another because I believed and know that you should be rooted and planted. You're rooted and planted at a church, not because they can do this or that for you, but because you're part of the body of Christ and you can do for the body and you can do for Christ. You can't serve God as an island with your talents and sit at home and not participate in the body of Christ. Because if you're the left hand and you don't show up, then what happens? Then the rest of the body's got to make up for what you're not here to do, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember that day very well. I'd been here for about six months. And I have, you know how we all come in, we all have our seats. We all have a place where we sit comfortably. And for some reason that day, I sat right there in the middle on the end. I usually sat over here. I don't know why I did. But I remember Scott was preaching, and he was preaching about sin and getting right in your life. And I sat there, and I was praying and thinking, and I'm like, God, is there any unconfessed sin? I don't, you know? And I felt led to come to the altar. And I'm like, God, I, I don't have anything to confess. Not that I can't do better, but I just... And he said, just go. And I came up and I knelt down right there in that corner. 
And the minute, the millisecond, my knee hit the floor, I heard somebody say, when are you going to accept your call to preach? I thought it was Scott. It was so vivid and so audible. I kind of stood up and looked around. The second my knee hit back again, I said, when are you going to accept your call to preach? I had a call to preach not long after I got saved. But did I do it? No. No, because I thought I knew better. No, because I thought that nobody had any desire to listen to anything that I had to say about God. And I remember calling Scott that next day on, on Monday, and I could hear him smile. <laughs> if, you, if you understand what I mean, you hear him smile on the phone. I said, Scott, do you know why I came to the altar yesterday? He's like, yeah, I got a pretty good idea. I said, well, you, you tell me what, what you think it was, and then I'll tell He's like, no, 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 you tell me first. And I told him, and I, I don't know how, but his smile got bigger on the phone, and I heard it. And he said, I've been praying that the Lord would send me somebody that I could mentor. And not long after that, I got involved in Nazarene Bible College to get my education for my ordination. And Scott came to me and said, Steve, I feel like the Lord is asking me to ask you to start a nursing home ministry. And I said, Mm, pretty sure that's not God. <laughs> I'm not real good with the whole elderly community thing, etc., etc. And he said, "Well, you pray about it." And I remember I went home and I prayed about it. And I said, "God, I said I will do whatever you want." I said, "But I don't know what to do or how to do it." And he just—I I could hear God smile and heaven just smile and say, "Steve." Just love them. Show up. Love them. Give them a hug. Let them know how important they are. They're not forgotten. That's all I did. That's all I did. Praise God, I had some great, wonderful people to join me. We sang and we had fun. Staff members, family members got saved. Uh, residents got saved. We even had a baptism. Uh, it, was, it was phenomenal. It was because of that, because of God asked Scott to ask me to do that because I was obedient to listen to do that, that I was recognized by the Ohio District Superintendent and asked me if I would take a church across the river. And I did. And it's been a blessing. God will not let you down. Yeah. Even when you let him down. And if you think you haven't let him down, might want to get back into your work because I promise you, you have. But God will never, ever, ever let us down. Lord, forgive me. That's uh, Judy. Judy told me that the chicken won't be done for two hours, so I needed to extend it. <laughs> so I hope you don't want. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I joke and play a lot because life is too serious. But one thing I don't joke about is salvation and serving God. God is so good and so great and so mighty. And whoever it is here today that d thinks that this is just, a, this is just I don't know, a show or a, a, something for the old people to get up and clap and, and whatever and uh, whatever you think that it might be, it's not. It's not. It's not a game. It's not a game at all. In fact, it's quite the reverse. It's a war. There are angels right now all around us, fighting Satan's angels. To get in here to tell you, don't listen to him. He don't know what he's talking about. Tell him to shut up and hurry up. I'm hungry. I got to get home and mow the lawn. I got to I have to get to bed early. I got to get up at 4 o'clock tomorrow for work. God just wants you to open your ears and your heart just for a few, few minutes, like the greys were singing. Open my heart. Turn with me to the book of Jonah. Very, if, you, if you know anything about this scripture, very familiar story. I'm going to reach out from chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord. 
and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarsus. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried, Every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you are, without a doubt, the most amazing thing in anyone's life. God, I want to give you all the glory as you give us the grace, Father. Let me be your vessel. Let our hearts and minds be open to hear what you have to say to us, Father, today. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And you know the story of Jonah, if, you, if you've read the Bible. If you, went to, to, if you went to any vacation Bible schools here, you know the story of Jonah. If you had Kay Lucas as your Sunday school teacher, you know a whole lot more. Whole lot. I learned so much from your Sunday schools. But we look at Jonah. When I was reading the scripture and I came across the book of Jonah and read it carefully, I thought to myself, you know, why would God go so far out of his way to make somebody do something they didn't want to do? And it kind of bothered me. I'll be honest with you, it kind of bothered me a little bit. Because the God I know and love and serve is awesome and wonderful and gracious. But guess what? He's also holy and just. Jonah had made a commitment to the Lord long before this time. That he would serve him and be his prophet. And then God said, hey, I want you to take this long trip over to this country here, this place, this city. Oh, yeah, these are people that you despise. These are people that you don't even want to be in the same room with. And I want you to preach to them and tell them that in 40 days, if they don't get themselves right, I'm going to destroy them. Jonah's like... Ah, uh, nope. <laughs> right? Goes, goes as far as the scripture says he went to pay his fare yeah. on the boat. He got on the boat. God said, I don't think you heard me. <laughs> Sends a great storm. The rest of the shipmates on there were terrified that they were in mind. Now understand, these men that were on the ship with him were seasoned men of the sea. Yeah. They weren't wimps, you know. You put me in a rowboat out on the, on the lake or something, I'm going to freak out. I'm going to tell you, I can swim. It's not pretty, but I, I'll get to the shore. <laughs> these were seasoned men. They started throwing their supplies, right? Their blankets, their food. Their, their water, whatever they had over the side because they didn't want the waves to tip them over and tear the ship apart. Where was Jonah? He was in the bottom in the side somewhere, right? Taking a nap. I love me some Nazarene naps, but I don't think I could be napping it when that's going on. Who does this sound like? A bad storm, sleeping in the boat. Sounds like Jesus to me. Jonah came up, realized what was going on, and still was disobedient with God, led them to draw straws, and finally he said, it's me. Throw me over. Now, 
Here's what I want to get to, to some of the young people. When, when we talk about reading the scripture, I've had many people tell me, Steve, every answer you need is right here. And I'm like, I don't see anything that Steve, take this job and drive here and turn there, take buy this house and don't do this one. And... But the answers are there. Amen. The answers are there if you're willing to search it out and look for it. And Jonah says, it's me. I want you to, to be, uh, let's, let's bring it home, so to speak, to realistic. I want you to think about, you're on a ship, a storm comes about, <clears throat> some dude from the bottom taking a nap going, oh, oh that's, yeah, it's my fault. Yeah, um. If you throw me overboard, you guys will be fine. <laughs> what? No, I'm not throwing you overboard. How is it? That doesn't even make any sense. We'll, we'll fight the storm, right? <coughs> Someone comes to you and says, basically, kill me and you'll live. Finally, they do it, right? Finally, he goes overboard. And the scripture says a great fish swallowed him up. Matthew says a whale. Isn't it amazing how God will get what he needs to get done, done? Our disobedience doesn't do anything against God's plan except rough us up. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you think you're not going to do something that you know God's told you to do, or vice versa, not do something he told you not to do or do, it's not going to prevent God's plan. But you're going to get roughed up in the midst. You know, I've had many non-Christians, and even, even Christians who I know, I believe they love God, say there are things in the scripture that just can't be true. They just, they can't be. I'm not going to steal your blessing, but if you want to do some research, it is not impossible for this to occur. Cows, we know, have many stomachs, right? And only God can have them eat green grass and make white milk. I don't really know how that works out, but whales are the same way. They have four stomachs. So it's possible. I wouldn't Suggest to go try it, but it's possible <clears throat> to live in that belly of a whale for three days. He spit up into Nineveh. He treks over there. Now, mind you, let's be realistic. This is a thing. The scripture is descriptive if we're willing to, to pull it out and, and put it in our mind the way we would understand it in today's terms. He had to smell like junk. <laughs> Three days surrounded by krill and fish. Mind you, the only whale big enough to swallow a human being whole is a sperm whale. And their diet does not consist of human beings in spite of what some may think. They eat smaller fish. <clears throat> and you can only imagine for three days and three nights, he's in there. The scripture tells us later in Jonah, he prayed for God to forgive him. He's, help me, Lord. Right? And all he had to do was pay the fare on the correct ship, going the correct way, instead of going to Tarshish. Mind you, he didn't get a refund, by the way. <laughs> and there he is for three days and three nights. No, he can spit up. And because of the digestive juices, he is white as a ghost. Pigment gone. Hair, if it wasn't gone, it was white. Smells awful. He walks into Nineveh. Now you've got to understand, these are things that you, you dig out of the scripture. 
Nineveh was a city. It was a great city of that time. In fact, it was around 760 B.C. And it was a great ancient city. It was approximately three square miles, 120,000 people. Now, because of its location, their skin color and their, their locality to the equator, their skin color was olive, it was brown. It would be like me going to downtown Detroit and saying, hey, Jesus loves you. Don't get all, don't, I, don't, I felt that. Don't get all goofy on me. You all know what I mean. Jonah walks in, smells awful, looks like a ghost and says, hey, 40 days, God's going to destroy you. Now, mind you, the whole time Jonah says, I don't want him to repent. I don't like him. They're, they're my enemy. I don't, I, I don't even want to be here. I had to take a whale to get here. You know? The whole time. But yet, he did it. And from the top down, it says, the top man down said, okay, you're right. You know what's really interesting? The name Jonah means dove. And we know what the dove means in the, in, in the scripture. And if you don't, get to reading. It means messenger. And isn't it interesting because a dove is white, pure. What's also interesting is that the name Nineveh ironically means handsome and agreeable. My wife will tell you that's my nickname. <laughs> Jonah's disobedience put other people in danger. Jonah's disobedience <coughs> didn't stop or prevent God from getting Nineveh to repent. <coughs> it just meant that God had to make a little detour for Jonah and have a whale ready to go when he went in. Can you imagine? Let's put it in terms that we would understand. You're driving down the road. There's five people in your car. Terrible storm comes along. Like tornado winds. One of them says, throw me out. Of course, you're like, what is wrong with you? Right? But you do what they say. You finally make that choice. You do, and then all of a sudden, calm. That's what God wants us to do today. He's ready to give you the calm in the midst of your storm. But you've got to stop disobeying. How many of us, I've been a Christian for almost 32 years. How many of us have said, use me, Lord. I'll go. Whatever you want me to do. And then the minute it interferes with that important football game. <laughs> The minute that it interferes with my Manny Petty, whatever thing y'all girls do. The minute it means that I have to take a step of faith and, and maybe quit a job or move to another city. It's like, whoa, whoa, wait, is that really God? I mean, you know, God, God wants me to be happy and comfortable. God wants you to be obedient. That's what he wants. The rest of that stuff will come. It will. It ain't always going to be happy and comfortable and wonderful. But you can be rest assured. He will get his job that he wants accomplished done. And if you're obedient, he'll reward you for it. You know, the, uh, the sperm whale has a, uh, uh, some sort of a sack of, uh, in their head to help them to find sound in the, in the ocean to be able to 
They use that like sonar. And the, the similarities and, and connections between what God did with Jonah and what we need to do in our lives is incredible. Because Jonah didn't listen. God put him in a whale who could help him listen. Had to be underwater for three days to do it. That same sack of oil or whatever it is, is used as a light, as a lamp oil, right? God wants to light your way. Sometimes he has to put you in a dark room for a while. Because you're unwilling to do what he wants you to do. And you say, oh, why me, Lord? And this is what God says. Because you said you would. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. My yay is supposed to mean yay and my nay is supposed to mean nay. I said I would serve you with all my heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And now you expect me to actually do it? That's so silly. In our culture today, right? I do doesn't mean anything anymore. I do means until I'm tired of your stuff. I do until something better comes along. It's always so much better. Grass ain't greener on the other side. Ask the cows. That went over your head. <laughs> God wants us to be what he called us to be. Not because he called us to be it, but because we said yes! Why do we fight with God? It is such a privilege and an honor to think to myself, I am the bride and Jesus is the groom. I get to spend eternity in heaven with him. I get to spend eternity with a father who's so holy that he illuminates my world without the help of an S-U-N. I get to serve a God who loves me so much. He sent his Holy Spirit to live inside me. In this dirty, filthy, fleshly temple. God's not playing. And we shouldn't either. You know, I'll, I'll, I, I, see, I see the looks of hunger on your faces, and, and this is for Joe. <laughs> I love you, Joe. I talk, about, I talk about you guys all the time with my wife. Funny stories and whatnot. But there's one other thing. Isn't it interesting that God used a, a, a whale, a sperm whale? We know whales are mammals, right? What that means is this large animal, technically not a fish, because it's a mammal, and the scripture says that there are four kinds of flesh, fish, fowls, creeping things, and humans, right? All your answers are in the scripture if you're not catching on to that yet. But the whale is living in an environment that is not conducive for him. What does that mean? That simply means that he lives in a world where he doesn't belong. We as Christians, we don't, we don't belong to the world. Right? We, we belong somewhere else. But God has some work for us to do. Not because he can't do it himself. Because he called us to do it and we said yes. And when we do it, we're rewarded for it. Not that we deserve it, but that's what makes God so awesome. If your son or daughter did something, or grandchild, so horrific, you couldn't believe it, go to jail for the rest of their life, you're going to stop loving them? No. Go to the ends of the earth for our children. 
I told, told my wife many times, I pray God never puts me in a position where I have to ask myself, would I hurt somebody else to protect my children or grandchildren? One great grandchild, too. And I'm afraid that the answer is yes, I would. I would do whatever it takes if, they, if it came to them. But the whale swims around and never stops swimming. The whale is not in an environment that's conducive to them, so they've got to come up for air sometimes, right? They've got to come up for oxygen, but they can't stop swimming because what happens if they stop swimming? They sink and they die. How many Christians do we know who stop swimming? How many men and women that you know love the Lord decided, I'm just going to stop doing it? And you look at them and you look at their lives over the years and things don't work out in their favor. Health takes a toll on them. And maybe they leave before they were supposed to. God calls somebody else to take their mantle up for whatever reason. They said yes, but they decided they were going to stop swimming around. As I get older and older, and I'm old, I'm 51. I know some of you are like, honey, you're just a baby. Um, as I get older and older, I've said this at the nursing home. I've said this since I've been a, a, a since I've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic situation. I don't care if you work the drive-thru at McDonald's or you're the CEO of some big company. It doesn't matter all of those things. God has you right where he wants you and needs you. And if you're a Christian, you've said yes. All he wants you to do is keep swimming. Stop disobeying and keep swimming. Fortunately, God is mercifully, mercifully enough that when we disobey, he can send a whale your way. Maybe I'm your whale today, I don't know. Maybe you're running from God. Maybe you know it's your time to get saved. Let me, let me drop you in on a little clue from the scripture. You don't get to choose when you get saved. Understand that you have to be called by the Holy Spirit through conviction. You don't get to just say one day on your deathbed, I better get it done. It'll work like that. It don't work like that. So if you feel the conviction of God right now, your heart's pumping, your hands are sweaty, maybe, maybe you got that, that nervous tap going on, don't worry, Judy, I won't put my foot on. Right? That's God saying, come. Oh, but Steve, don't be embarrassed. Oh, but Steve, everybody's hungry and they want to go eat. Oh, but Steve, this. How about, oh, but God. Amen. You loved us so much that you were willing to send your son. He stepped out of glory. Amen. Gave up all his power. Right? He said yes. Garden of Gethsemane, he said, take this from me if you could. But your will be done, God. Jonah didn't do that. Jonah was like, I'll do all that except this. And then he did it. 120,000 people got saved, give or take. And if you look closely and do your research, you'll see that that city stood, Nineveh, for almost 150 additional years. God was going to destroy them. And even when the Medes came to take that city, it took them three months before they could make that city fall. That's the power 
of God. That's the power of the person that we serve. That's the power of the person who loved you so much that he created you and knew you were going to mess up and said, that's okay, I'll come down, I'll be one of them, I'll die on the cross, rise again, and I'll come back and take them. All they have to do is be obedient and say yes. Pastor Scott, if I could, I, I'd like the great family to come and, and, and have a, a song, whatever the Lord puts on your heart, to come, to come. <clears throat> Pastor Steve, I've been, I've been saved for 63 years. But I feel a conviction that the Lord's called me to do something. Need to make a change. Uh, I need to make amends for something. I've been running from this thing, whatever it is. Come. Come. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? God didn't promise you tomorrow. He actually hasn't even promised you the rest of today. That's why it's called a present, because it's the present, and it's your present. God doesn't live in the past or the future. God's outside of time. There's no past, present, and future. It's all present to him. 